All right, welcome back to the Medium Cool Show, episode 12. Yeah. We're back again with another episode with Felix and Jacob a week later. Last week we had John Slavin. That was kind of an interesting experience. I mean, I wouldn't say it was great. I wish things could have been like a little more organized. He was like staying with us like the past week or like for you like stay with us like four nights you know that was like what we had going on a lot has happened in the past week yeah it was interesting having john here he's a character dude i feel like he was kind of prepping for the podcast you know he's kind the of show amp- yeah he's kind of amping us up for the show and then he gets on and then he's like all right peace yeah like, like in the middle of it and i was like oh i thought we were gonna yeah. do this whole thing you know? yeah no like if you watch episode 11, after we talk about Under the Silver Lake, he's there and then he just is gone. He's like, is that it? All right, I'm gonna, I gotta go. I gotta go do something. I think, he, like, I think he just like walked around. Yeah, next time we have a guest on, they have to watch the, all the movies. Yeah, they have to stay on the whole time. Yeah, it's kind of like weird and like, you know, I want them to try when they're on the show, right? Yeah. But you want them to be, I want them to be comfortable and like want to do it. Yeah. Obviously, it's not like super duper serious. Well, I think the thing is when he did, Right after watching that movie, it felt like a show. It didn't feel like we were talking about movies. You know what I mean? Mm. Like it felt like, okay, I'm here for this one thing. All right, peace. Whereas like when it's you, me, or like Jake or something, it's like we watch the movies and we're just talking about the movies. Yeah, yeah. It just needs to be like a little more cohesive. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like the end of the Silver Lake episode wasn't like the best episode, dude. Yeah. Like it was like the least viewed video by far. Yeah, Last but week, that's just yeah. like, you can't say that it's a bad episode just because it's at least... You no, know, it's not a bad ep- It wasn't a bad episode. That, I'm just talking about that portion, that video. Like, everything yeah. else was really good. Like, the King of New York video, like, yeah. did really well, bro. Yeah. You know, I didn't expect that at all. Yeah, we just kind of had those. Little, yeah, like, like, there's, like, those movies. I don't know, like, I think people like that type of crime yeah. shit. I do, too, you know? But what have you been up to the past week? Just working, hanging out with Ava. Ava, your yeah. girlfriend? Mm-hmm. I don't know, watching movies, dude. Yeah, yeah. We, we shot. We did, we shot, yeah. Shot with Chris. Yeah. yeah. About that. That was, that was fun. It's yeah, always shot. fun to shoot with him. We hung out, with, we were with John every night last week, and then we hung out with Ian on Friday. And then on Saturday, like, I went out. It was an interesting night. And then the next day, I went to set and worked, like, 14 hours with Chris. Mm-hmm. And then the day after that. Monday night here yeah we went to luke's birthday party oh yeah and then we went to luke's birthday party yeah 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 we saw jake and brandon jake's roommate yesterday i went to ai on the lot which was an event for filmmakers and ai developers or something like that people in ai to meet creatives and there was panels and stuff and they talked about the future of AI and how it's impacting the industry. Yeah, very timely for now, because that's what everyone's talking about now. AI is so so hype right now. We just see all of these videos on YouTube of AI created images and pictures and songs by artists, and it's like a very big deal right now. Yeah, Yeah. I feel like if you told me you went to some kind of cryptocurrency event last year at this time, I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah, yeah. It's kind of that wave right now. Yeah, it's kind of a wave for sure. And NFTs and all that fucking bullshit. Yeah, bro. (laughs) Like, the event was like, you know, it was cool the way it was put together and stuff. And I respect that the guys tried to do it and everything, you know. But yeah. um, it was, like, kind of boring, dude. Yeah, Mike Joya. Yeah, Mike Joya and Ian Eck. It was cool uh, for the most part. I mean, I was, like, volunteering, helping out there and shit. And I saw, I listened to some of the panels, but a lot of it was kind of, like, it felt kind of like Hollywood sycophantic type shit where, mm-hmm. like, people were kind of dick writing others. And then yeah. when you try to talk to them, they're, like, really standoffish, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. Like, they're all in their own worlds there and stuff, I know. you know? Like, I, know. I got that feeling, like, from a bunch of different people but i did also meet some really cool people too that like had some questions that, that i had to answer about ai like really like being able to like edit multicam and then having the programs you know detect words to cut out and dead space to cut out and type shit like that like i just was trying to get some advice to like make the show mm-hmm. editing the show maybe there's a way that it would edit it for us you know yeah. we would go in and like tweak it but yeah i met, I met some cool people too but also it was like there were some really pretentious people yeah, you felt like you learned something that. Like, yeah, yeah, I got some now. good. I got some. Yeah, yeah, and I, and I met. I met some connections too. But like, what do you think about AI in like a creative space? Hold on. Let me go do one thing really quick. Are you taking a shit? No, I have. 
Sorry, folks. Uh, Jacob is getting some tums right now for his little belly. His little belly is aching, you know, he's having some heartburn and hell yeah. Fucking right. We're gonna do it. Oh, oh, just let me get one. How many do you take? I took one. Yeah. I, fucking... like, I can't think when I have hyper in here. Time to get fucked up. Look at that badass, dude. Mmm. Ah, oh, I'm tripping. Anyway, my question was, Jacob, this is our little AI panel right now. Mm -hmm. All right? Oh, so, Jacob's all. How do you feel about AI in the creative space? Now and going forward. Mm -hmm. Listen, I, I think, like, AI is has a lot of benefits. There's no doubt about it that, like, it's going to be involved in our lives in the future. I'm, I feel like I'm a little old-fashioned. I was telling Peyton this yesterday. I'm like, dude, I think I'm kind of, like, behind the curve on AI. Like, I'm not really, like, fucking with it that hard. That's how I felt about, like, crypto and, uh fucking nfts i like felt like i was behind on that too mm -hmm. but i'm like man i shouldn't just discount it i'm not going to just discount ai I, I, it's like it's here you can't stop it you know the thing is though i feel like people definitely blow it out of proportion mm -hmm. they feel like tech advances so fast nowadays that they're caught up with tech but like people need to wrap like people need at least like five years to wrap their head around shit you know what I mean? Like humans, we don't actually change that much in like a couple of years. Yeah, and you, and it, we don't everything we we can't we, we can't predict things, dude. It's unpredictable. Yeah. Like I remember VR was really popular like four years ago, three years ago, and now yeah. it's kind of like the hype is not it doesn't really come around like on a bigger mainstream level that everything is everyone's using it. You know? Yeah. But here, here's what I was gonna say. I never think that AI is gonna be able to replace visual media or. I feel like it's a tool to aid us, but to say that it would, like, replace the need for, like, writers or the need for, like, a cameraman or an editor or something, yeah, I think is a kind of disingenuous statement because the thing that we as an audience connect with the most is the emotional conviction that's, like, displayed through art. I feel like AI can't replicate that. So I'm pretty confident that no one's going to be replaced. I just think it's going to be definitely... But the thing is, it hasn't replaced anything yet. No. Like, it hasn't happened yet. No. So if it hasn't happened yet, it doesn't mean that's going to happen, right? Like, once it starts happening, like, once things start getting replaced, like, when it actually happens, then it's kind of like, okay, I see it. That, that actually hasn't happened yet. Or mm -hmm. something's been replaced, actually. So that's the whole thing. Like, it's like cool little experiments. It's basically just taking information and putting it into a program, and then it's... Just, make something out of that it's not necessarily like making its own decisions no it's not you know? like, it's not it's sentient. not intelligence yeah yeah it's not it's sentient not, it's not intelligence it's a computer program it's not actually an artificial intelligence it's the word is kind of not super accurate but I, people like to use it like it's like robots yeah like, yeah it it's over, like a hot it's, it's a hot topic right now the thing is though like chat gpt even like chat gpt is not like sentient no you know what i mean like it's 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 a robot in the sense that it has awareness of certain like keywords and takes from like all different spots in the internet to form a sentence to replicate things that have already been said before but it's not actually like original uh, there's there's a there's a distinction there yeah it's just like a program i mean it's cool like that it's able to produce cool looking things i mean i've seen images and stuff that are cool and like i guess ai voice is somewhat cool have know. you seen all like the fucking wes anderson shit yeah yeah yeah. i've been seeing that so stupid it looks like really like play doh -y, you know yeah it looks like ass dude it doesn't look like actual people that's the no. thing like there's another discussion about computer generated images with ai because it's all computer generated images every time like a movie comes out that has computer generated images like st the newest state of the art picture it always looks like really cool and you're like wow this looks super realistic and then a few years pass by and you you watch it and you, you think to yourself this doesn't look as good anymore this looks kind of yeah. bad yeah so anytime any real photorealistic cgi comes out even if the ai generates it it's going to age so poorly compared to real life mm -hmm. things that are real life like when we watch the dark knight all the practicals look so good and then all the cgi stuff looked really bad yeah but i think it's cool for automation like i'm i just want to see it implemented more in society which it hasn't done yet mostly just a creative discussion right now yeah it is. and with the writer strike that's going on what, what about it, that like it's like in the discussion but i don't think they have anything to worry about writers no yeah no they don't hopefully cars will be replaced and trucks and you know fast food workers mm -hmm. they'll all be like goodbye mm -hmm. I mean, and, then, already... and then high-end restaurants will have waiters because it's like 
fancy, you yeah. know, it's kind of like a luxury. Riding a horse used to be the main mode of transportation mm-hmm. back in the day. Now it's seen as a sort of a higher class elitist luxury to ride a horse instead of taking a car. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Or like driving a car in the future will be like a luxury that like not a lot of people can afford because everything is so automated. Well, cars just make it so much more easier and efficient, right? So that's the thing. It's like carriage versus car. Don't have to like take care of the horses, upkeep stables, whatnot. You just have to like pay for gasoline, upkeep your car and stuff. And it's just, it's easier and more efficient. The question is like, will self-driving cars be more efficient for people? You know, like, is it, is it, will it ever get to a stage where it's like, your ability to drive is hindering other people's ability to like be efficient Mm. you know what i mean yeah i think they're gonna have laws that say oh if you don't have a self-driving car to use you can't go on the highway yeah but you can use like side streets and stuff because on the highway it'll be like all the cars will be so in sync going like 250 an hour yeah like just right behind each other like super smooth like traffic won't hopefully Mm -hmm. won't like exist because of just how like everything will just communicate with each other yeah whereas like human brains are so like have all this error and like yeah road rage and all that hopefully will be gone and yeah you know maybe it'll be it's it's cool to think they would be better for society and that can take away all the poverty and stuff if there's like Basic income or just, you know, people who are impoverished. Can... It's never going to fucking happen. It's never going to happen Even if automation happens. America. Yeah. Well, not in our system, right? I mean, down the line, maybe. Damn, when do we turn into a science podcast, dude? Theoretical podcast? Well, just like really big in the film talk, but no one's ever going to make, no computer's ever going to make something that looks like a Christopher Nolan movie that's shot on film. Yeah, you know? yeah. That's, it's, you just can't replicate real life in images. Yeah. Just not. I just don't see that happening because CGI like ages so poorly, bro. Yeah. And real, your eyes can tell. A painting is real, like paint, like it's physical. You can tell, yeah. You can tell the texture and everything. Mm-hmm. Like when you see AI generated images or like AI generated videos, dude, God, they look so weird, dude. Mm-hmm. They really are so bizarre. The way like the background kind of like it's like watercolor, you know, it's like flows and it's like changing, like trying to find like the right algorithm to like change into like a tree, you know? Yeah, do the writers strike <laughs> the unions? Yeah, what about how long are they going to go and strike for? Probably like at least six months. Wow, so all the writers are unemployed? Yeah, I think so. Wow. What are you going to do, you know? It's important, though. The shit that, like, Apple and Netflix are trying to pull, like, underpaying people, all that bullshit. Hey, man. Underpaying people is just what capitalism is. (laughs) We watched a movie from 1998, directed by Newt Arnold, starring Belgian action movie star Mr. Jean-Claude Van Damme. Bloodsport, 1988. Bloodsport. Mm-hmm. Yeah. This is a nice cut and dry, tight, 90-minute martial arts action movie based on the real-life Frank Dukes. It's kind of debated now whether or not this actually happened, though. This is, this is a true story now because apparently one of the producers said that the real guy was, like, full of shit or something. Dude, he's so full of shit. Have you seen him? No. He's like... Frank he, Dukes? Yeah, Frank Dukes. He just looks like a normal dude. Mm-hmm. He doesn't look like he... I don't know. He's, well, he doesn't look like an action movie star, no. No, he doesn't look like an action movie star, but like, I feel like at like like George Foreman, right? He's like really fucking old and he still like knocks someone out and I can tell he's like a fucking boxer. Yeah. Even at like an old age. Mm-hmm. He still have like those skills. This guy does not look like... You can't really perceive it, but... Even then, the fact that he's saying, and this is how the story goes, is he said, like, he fought in, like, 200 fights oh, yeah, in, like, yeah. five years or yeah. something like that. Something like that, yeah. No one no one can do that, dude. There's a reason that boxers do, like, one fight every two years. It's because it's not sustainable to have, like, MMA and, like, have a fight every month. Yeah. It gets so fucked up, dude. Yeah. Jean-Claude Van Damme plays this real-life, or based on this real-life character, yeah. Frank Dukes, which is a cool ass name, dude. Dude, that's a badass name. Yeah, man. like Frank Dukes, you know, Frank D U X. Mm-hmm. That's a fucking cool name. And, and basically, he's a war hero or he was in the military in the United States or something. Yeah, he's in he the military. Home. He seems like in the military, he's in the US military. So he's, I think his family's from France or something. 
moved to America and when we're introduced to him, he's running away from like a military boot camp. And my understanding is like he's a soldier there training, but he's a like hot, hot commodity for them. Mm. Yeah, yeah, he's a really good soldier. Yeah, he's a re- he seems he's really like he's badass. a really badass. Yeah, yeah, really yeah. badass. Yeah. And we go into his backstory. We start at the beginning where he's breaking into this Asian guy's house. Yeah. He gets caught and punished and mm-hmm. he then Frank Dukes decides that, you know, he wants to try to be trained by this guy and yeah. mixed martial arts shit that they do. What's, his, what's his name? S- S- Tanashi. Sayashi. Tanashi or something like that. Tanake. Tanata. Something like that. He uh, decides to train Frank Dukes, Jean-Claude Van Damme, and we get a whole sequence, this whole montage training sequence that's yeah. pretty cool. Kind of like Kill Bill training. You know? Yeah. Kind of typical like training sequence. It's cool to see them do it. But the only reason he's agreeing to train him is because he's like you'll be a sparring partner with my son and then his son passes away and we learn that his teachers like lost his family in the war he had to rebuild that and he had another son and then he lost this son so he feels really like he can't leave any lineage behind yeah frank dukes is like train me i'll be i'll fight for you i'll do this in in your honor and so he finally agrees to do it and you just see this sick ass like training montage right off the bat right at the beginning yeah. of the movie and you never really do that you know like nowadays but they just decide hey we're gonna get this out of the way mm. you see how frank dukes kind of just like becomes this fucking badass just from all this hard work and dedication and blood sweat and tears yeah and he's like a super straight laced guy yeah but he's like fucking huge yeah he's fucking jacked in this dude yeah. holy shit dude and then he decides i don't know exactly what the motivation is for him what's the so he goes and and the the actual arc the actual story plot is that he fights in this martial arts tournament in, in Hong Kong that's kind of underground, like controlled by the mafia, you know, not super regulated because people end up dying in this. Mm-hmm, yeah. And they just seem to be like, okay with it because I think the triad runs it. There's a little bit of an explanation by who runs it, but it's like a mafia in Hong Kong. It's out of the jurisdiction of Hong Kong. So it's in China. And so that's yeah. how they're able to get away mm-hmm. with it. But then we get to the martial arts tournament and this is where the movie i think really like shines is the fighting that's kind of what we're looking for is that the yeah. fights are like really the highlights of this yeah movie we kind of get this cur- it's kind of like karate kid i guess more violent because people are, are dying yeah. and stuff and there's more like a higher stakes and the whole movie is basically just this t- tournament you know with some characters coming in and out some love interests some friends that he meets that yeah that we have to that we become connected with and when something bad happens to them we like feel bad for frank duke's the villain is set up and then it's just eventually like one big showdown the fighting in this is super dope and i I like the the, there's like kind of these close-ups so they're like "Ah." yeah slow-mo close-ups yeah 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 and he's like yeah "Yeah," and he's like "Ah." yeah up until so what's interesting is that jean claude van damme who's our hero he's basically invincible throughout the whole movie you know what i mean he, he learns to fight blinded he, like he, he he like went through this crazy training sequence with his master he's, he learns to be able to see things like blindfolded and fight like blindfolded and stuff yeah. and he basically becomes a monk mm-hmm. where like nothing can you know like bother him and stuff it's basically all of his superpowers that he has throughout the movie and when he fights people in the in the ring like there's not very much a struggle there like he you're just like oh this guy's untouchable he's invincible you know until yeah. the last fight where the the main you know antagonist or whatever you say like the, the big bad bully character mm-hmm. cheats and like blinds him mm-hmm. in the fight even though and that's like kind of what takes away like his superpowers are are taken away at that point in time mm-hmm. and he has to fight the villain yeah without his powers which yeah, it's is like, like karate kid you know yeah yeah it's like he has to fight all the whole time he had his powers behind him. You know, like Tarantino said, Corbucci, the hero is an anti-hero throughout the whole movie, and he only becomes a hero when he has to face the villain without superpowers. Yeah. Which is kind of what happens to Jean-Claude Van Damme, which is yeah. kind of like a I feel like it's kind of an action trope type shit where the hero gets his powers taken away and he has to face his biggest challenge yet and overcome that. Yeah. Which he does. I won't spoil it. You know he's gonna win the fight, yeah. you know what I mean? Like, it's you know an 80s action movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dude, this movie's very 80s. Yeah, it's super 80s. It oozes 80s. Well, it came out in 1988. Like, it came yeah. out. Yeah. yeah, I mean, like, it, it. it's 80s 
in a way where it's like big dudes, very like very masculine. Yeah, kind of, they, it's like he's like a he. I feel like Jean Claude Van Damme is, attracts both men and women yeah. in this because it's yeah. very like homoerotic. Dude, yeah. there's a there's a lot of like things where I'm like, but you see his ass. Yeah, you don't see any girl's ass in like, yeah. this whole movie, which is kind of crazy for like a 1988 martial arts movie where you feel like this is like a masculine film for men who would like. I feel like only men are into this, like watch this movie, but it's super Jean Claude Van Damme yeah. thirsty, you know? Yeah, it, it's it's a uh, it's very campy, but in a good way. Like we said, it's very cut and dry. It doesn't try to like drag you on. It doesn't give you any bullshit. No, you know? it's it's very like it moves and you're like into it, and it's 90 minutes cut and dry put together and. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's pretty cool. And I think this was really was Jean Claude Van Damme's breakout film yeah. before he did all of those other films, which I I actually want to watch some of those. Yeah, me too. Movies and yeah. stuff, but it's definitely like a cult film. Yeah, I, I'm into it. I'm kind of into like I kind of could go on like a little action movie '80s kick, like because I just watched Marked for Death with mm-hmm. Steven Seagal. That was like a fun little goofy. Mm-hmm. That one was a little more like goofy than uh, I like Bloodsport more, but I kind of like seeing those. Types, you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger, Sly Stallone type, yeah. type beat. I do too. I want to see more of his stuff. This was a really good, this is a really good starting point. Yeah, we should get more into it. Okay, Forrest Whitaker is in the movie with the other guy and he has to chase him around yeah. Hong Kong and it's kind of goofy. Yeah, it's... it. There's like literally not any resistance to John claude Van Damme until the end of the movie. Yeah. Right? There's yeah. like literally no resistance whatsoever. Maybe like a little bit of like punching going on. Yeah. Until the like very last fight of the movie because he's just so fucking badass and he's just doing these like fucking fucking twists him like he's like... You know those kicks where he's like twists and kicks. yeah, like a roadhouse kick. Roundhouse yeah, dude, those kick, fuck. Yeah. He just like does that like ten times in a row, dude. Yeah, yeah. insane. Yeah, and he just like his splits. You know. Yeah, where it's like he like does the thing where it's like the punch of death. There's so, like the finger. Of yeah, death. he's like, like then he punches the brick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and the brick just like and they automatically explodes, like the one underneath. Yeah, and they automatically respect him. Yeah, they they automatically respect him. But he's also like so like he's so timid. He's such a polite guy. Why and does... his friend is so like fucking boisterous and yeah like, he's like an american fucking white yeah. trash yeah venice yeah why do people why do they all hate him though like why do they all hate john claude van damme like why does he want to why, why does that guy want to kill him so bad because that dude's like the the guy that wants to kill him so bad is the bully and it's because he's threatened because he's threatened by his position mm-hmm. in the what, what do they call it it's not blood sport but they call it something else oh kumite yeah the kumite Kumate? Yeah, Kumate. Yeah, the, the Kumate. Kumate. Yeah. Kumate. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> They're, he's threatened by him. That's the only reason. And that dude's also pretty bad. That dude's like fucking jacked too. Oh my god. Yeah, so the US government sends these two agents to go and pick up Jean-Claude Van Damme because they don't want him injured because he's a special asset for the US government. Yeah. And then they literally like can't do it the whole time. No, they can't. Like they can't even like... They can barely track him down. It's like they're there on vacation. Yeah. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like, kind of enjoying themselves. And they finally get to him. And Jai Kwan Van Damme, of course, is like, they try to tase him. And he, like, fucking, like, flips it around on them. And mm-hmm. he's like, I'll see you at the airplane tomorrow. And just leaves. And they're like, what are we going to do now? Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. This is kind of a different type of, because I think Forrest Whitaker, we're kind of used to seeing him in a more, like, masculine, badass role. And this one, he's kind of, like, clue, he's, he's, like, a clueless yeah. guy. Like, Yeah, this know. is him, like. It's not ghost dog level. No, but this is him, like, maybe, like, bro, fucking... it's, like, a couple years after, like, Fast Times at Richmond High. Like, this is a young Forrest Whitaker. Ghost dog is so fucking good. Ghost Dog's so good, dude. We should talk about that. Like, yeah, I love like I I love talking about Jim Jarmusch. We should watch more of his stuff. Yeah, but w- anyway, uh, anything more you want to say about Bloodsport, directed by Newt Arnold? I really think like there are certain things in the eighties. You've heard Tarantino's take on Top Gun, the original one, how it's kind of written from the perspective of like a gay man, you know. I feel like this movie is kind of the same way. There's a lot of storyline and stuff in there with like him and this guy he meets or they're like, I think it's just like the 80s, like camaraderie, like camaraderie that they had in the 80s where it's like, we're fucking masculine and we're men, but we're brothers. But mm, it, there's I, definitely I like times, <laughs> there's definitely times where it's like, I don't know, it's kind of like they're, they're a couple, you know, like he, 
I think he has more intimate moments with that like greasy American dude than he does with like the mm. girl he meets. There's like they, he 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 fucks her, but it just cuts to like her with her shirt on, laying in bed in the morning. He's like not even in the bed, and then he like <laughs> his ass he's, is like, out. He's like on his pants, like, yeah, and he's just like ass is out, and he's yeah. like, whoa, this is uh, yeah. I wonder what that was because this is like 1980s, not like now, you know. I don't know. Yeah, but it was kind it's of... It's kind of like, objectifying men in a way. like Yeah, but yeah. I mean, like, it wasn't, you know, unheard of to have homosexual storylines then, you know? Yeah, like subliminal ones. like Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And no, there's definitely that going on in this, but yeah. it's still like a masculine, cool guy in movie. Yeah. Who doesn't like cool fight scenes? Yeah, exactly. Who doesn't, dude? Who? Yeah. Tell me who. Certain women. Bloodsport pretty good fight scenes uh, for its time you know what i mean like mm-hmm. pretty cool fight scenes like i feel like they could have sped it up a little bit to make it like a little more packed yeah i'm sure it's all in real time all real like they're all really touching each other it's all real stunts and john claude van damme probably actually knows how to fight dude yeah oh you can tell that they're professional you can tell that it's like they took these martial artists and then made them movie stars because mm-hmm. Steven Seagal was a martial artist, like Black Belt ran his own dojo, like yeah. he was trained from his master and like mm-hmm. trained him and he took over his master's dojo and stuff. And then he started like producing his own movies and, and whatever. So yeah, you can tell like it's actually all real like fighting shit. Like they know what yeah. they're doing, you know? Yeah. No stunt guys for real action movie stars. And I respect that. But now we'll segue into The Dark Knight from 2008. And what do you think about the fight scenes in The Dark Knight? <laughs> Dark Knight, 2008, directed by Christopher Nolan. I don't know if you guys have heard of it. A little-known indie film. But what do you think about the fight scenes in it? The fight scenes, uh, they're all right. They're not amazing. There's nothing, like, crazy about it. Yeah. Some, like, choreography is really cool. He's like... (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, there's, like... uh... He's like... Yeah. There's some, like, really cool scenes, though. Like, the driving scenes are really cool. Some of, like, the stunts are really cool. Like, where Batman, like, it's, like, smacked up against a wall, you know? Or, like, when he jumps down onto the car at the beginning with yeah. Scarecrow. Yeah, no, no, like, there's really great action. It's one of the greatest action movies of all time. But in terms of, like, hand-to-hand combat... Yeah, it's very stiff. Yeah, it's very stiff. It's very, like, the camera does the trick for you. Yeah. You know? I think that costume, it's too stiff. For him and the costumes kind of like Batman costumes a little bit goofy around the neck area, yeah. dude. Well, that's like, what he said at the beginning. When they turn, they're like, yeah, like that's how like yeah. Batman, yeah. But that's what he said at the beginning when he gives it to um, I mean, what's his name, um, Mr. Fox, um, Lucius Fox, Morgan Freeman. Yeah, Morgan Freeman. When he gives it to him, he's like, yeah, I'm, I want to make these changes to my neck so that I can turn my head. Travis Scott, Batman, you <laughs> sure? He's like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's weird, dude. I don't know. I always think Batman looks, like, pretty goofy. Yeah. Like, I thought Ben Affleck's Batman was, like, one of the coolest Batmans because he was just so, like, big and menacing, you yeah. know what I mean? Like, yeah. that's, I'm like, dude, that's fucking badass. Mm. But then, I, I like Robert Pattinson's Batman. It's, like, more, like, that scene, he's more nimble and skinny. And he's, shit, like, grounded, yeah. too. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I like, I, dude, I mean. We can talk about the Batman next week, dude. That's a good movie. Yeah, I like the Batman a lot. I know it's kind of polarizing, but I really like the Batman. I think watching The Dark Knight now, I think for this discussion, we don't really need to talk about, like, I mean, people over talk The Dark Knight, you know what I mean? We should, yeah. like, I kind of wanted to steer this conversation. We kind of talked about before about, like, how it's aged, like, watching it now and stuff. Yeah. And I'd be like, because I hadn't seen it since four or five years ago, so I haven't seen it in a while, but, like, watching it now, I kind of, like, see things a little yeah. differently i don't know about you like it looks a little no uh, anyway. i yeah. i agree with you i agree with you i hadn't seen this in a long time maybe not a long time maybe i saw this in like 2018 or something like that but there are definitely things where my cgi looks a little bad the lighting mm-hmm. looks a little bit like i'm like that's 2008 lighting mm-hmm. you mm-hmm. know the cameras they use, I'm like, that's 2008. It's, it's Hollywood. It's, it, 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 it really feels very, is, yeah. It's an operatic Christopher Nolan movie where he's making The Dark Knight in, like, mm-hmm. 2008. Compared to, like, his more, his mo- newer movies are, like, way more grounded, less operatic, less mm-hmm. Hollywood cheese type shit. Like, yeah. Tenet is, like, really, like, grounded. Dunkirk is, like, really, there's no, there's no operatics in Dunkirk until, like, the very end where fucking yeah. Harry Styles on the train and he was, like, 
Winston Churchill said this. And he reads the quote and there's that music and it's kind of a little corny. But other than that, his newer movies are super more like minimal, like grounded shit. And the, and the yeah. fighting is also much better. I know it's crazy because it, it's like he shot the whole thing on a stage. So that's insane, you know? Mm. But there's some like kind of corny moments in The Dark Knight. Like yeah. Harvey Dent and like Rachel and like there's like music playing that yeah. accentuates it. That makes it just, it has like a Hollywood feel to it. You know yeah. what I mean? We were all talking during the movie, but the like times we shut up or like during the Joker scene. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All that stuff is good. You know, I think what I love the most about this movie are the thematics, mm-hmm. the themes that are going on about yeah. the morality and shit, and like how far can Batman go? The Joker's philosophy and like also Michael Caine is so fucking good. And oh, he's so good. Those yeah. conversations he has with Bruce Wayne about. Yeah. You know, the ruby, the size of a tangerine. <laughs> yeah. You know? Yeah. Like, all that is so really... Yeah. That's the most interesting part is the... This whole, like, yeah, the whole vigilante stuff. And there's just so much packed in there about, like, ethics. Yeah. I think it's an interesting concept. Like, the only way that he can defeat the Joker is if he becomes just as bad as him. Yeah. I love the concept, too, where it's like he's trying to figure out what the joker want like what his motives are and, and that's the whole that's the whole crisis he kind of runs into where it's like sometimes there's no reason rhyme or reason for this it's just sometimes gotham's just unsafe you know gotham uh, oh. sounds like a terrible place to live dude it's fucking like it's fucking i'd move out of there instantly dude it sounds so crime rated well it's just, just like, chicago like Chicago. It's not Chicago, though. It's, like, fucking worse than Chicago. It's so um, bad, dude. Also, we need to talk about this idea. And, and the, you know, we got to talk about Bush and 9-11. Yeah. Yeah, because it is, we were talking about this, a very post-9-11 movie. It's a very American, mm-hmm. the cops are good, mm-hmm. 9-11 type movie. Where all these, like, all this, these shots of buildings, like, burnt down and in the rubble and Mm -hmm. type of shit like that you know and very much like a kind of militaristic fantasy movie yeah especially christopher nolan's batman's yeah 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 it's definitely super bush era patriot act Mm -hmm. looking at cell phones to find a terrorist see there's a terrorist like how like what what can the government do ethically to like what what's okay for them to do yeah that's intruding on our liberties in order to find a terrorist type beat that's going down yeah very interesting look in like a period of history in america yeah because when you when you look at uh the batman now it's doing more of a sort of like incel type shit go like there's it's more of like an incel online school shooter type vibe i mean the riddler and stuff yeah 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 Yeah. Yeah, it's definitely that like yeah the commentary is like even more grounded this is like Definitely militaristic fantasy um, mixed in with, like, American patriotism. It's crazy. It, I, I wouldn't say it ages poorly, but I do think that it ages because of it, you know? Yeah, yeah. And I, I think that, like, he was almost still trying to find his epic style, Christopher Nolan. Like, I think, he found, I, I think he found his style, like, even with Memento. But, like, that was, like, a smaller movie. Like, he had a voice, and then it wasn't... Now his voice is, like, the epic art house action movies that were, he, like, dialed in more with, like, his later movies. And Dark Knight was kind of, like, the beginning of that sort of grounded style. But it still had that operatic, like, that minimalist grounded style. There's still, like, emotions in it and stuff, which kind of got rid of, like, later on, you know? Mm-hmm. Where do you feel like he found his style, then? Would you, would you say it's the Dark Knight is where he kind of breaks into that? Or would you say it's, like... Well, the Batman Begins was, like, the first one where you're see this really grounded superhero movie where it's like the tank is the card super super industrialist yeah after interstellar when he made like dunkirk Mm -hmm. he just like we're gonna make the best shit we're gonna get rid of all the emotions and just like work on like the action and the suspense and all of this this, just like the spectacle of it and we're Mm -hmm. gonna forget about emotions like after interstellar he's like he's like "No, no no we're just gonna get rid of like everything's gonna be cold and we're just gonna focus on like the visuals and the you know what's going on and like the, mm. the overall experience of this yeah. shit and like tenet it's like you don't know anything about these characters and, yeah but still it's like dope like tenet is like i love tenet dude yeah me yeah. too tenet's his spy movie dude i say that time and time again that's his james bond mm-hmm. i'm curious about oppenheimer if we're gonna see it swing back the other way or we're gonna see in kind of like little snippets of this guy's life 
Yeah. And, and the process of making the atomic bomb kind of inspired by the way he shot Dunkirk. Yeah, and I, I think Oppenheimer is going to kind of be like Dunkirk where it might, I mean, it is called Oppenheimer and, and Killian Murphy plays Oppenheimer, but it's going to be like an ensemble kind of cast. Maybe we're going to be jumping around a lot from different characters like in Dunkirk. You know? yeah. It's not going to be just like one main character. Heath Ledger's Joker is still really great. He's still so good, dude. Like, watching him, again, I didn't realize how much I missed seeing him. It's such a shame that we lost him at such a young age because he's such a talented actor, dude. He's such a good character actor. And yeah. I felt, watching him, I felt sad because I felt unfamiliar with him. I was like, how much of that is Joker's voice? How much of that is, like, Heath's voice? You yeah, know? we'll never really know, like, but he kind of just gave his whole life to this one role that became legendary. Yeah. So, mm-hmm. so good. Such a good commentary on just, like, society and it has a noir feel to it as well where it's like like everything's so big that you can't stop it yeah and he eventually just takes the fall for everything just so that gotham can have this hero yeah represent them what do you think about harvey dent and stuff like that he's a little corny yeah aaron eckhart like i think he's a good actor and everything looking back on it now when i was a kid i was like this guy's good he's standing up for what he believes in he's trying to make a change in this city and he really is kind of like taking this bigger than life political character Mm -hmm. but watching it now i'm like going through what we've gone through in like the past couple years and how like political people want to be nowadays it felt very like corny and dated yeah and i think this whole thing about in this movie like the cops are like pretty good people yeah whereas now it's like the opposite and like the cops in the batman movie are like fucking huge assholes and yeah also you see it in, sp- in the spider-man movies from the 2000s the sam Raimi spider-man movies they're like very much american like cops are good yeah like there's a part of spider-man 3 when he, he comes back to fight all the three villains and then he like lands right in front of the american flag and yeah yeah all the cops are there and shit. yeah, and he's yeah. Like talking to the cops and he's like what do i need to do and they're like they're like telling him yeah. shit. and he's like collaborating with the police you know yeah that's not the case anymore no at least for now right yeah it's funny because you were talking about how when we came back you're driving back you're saying every single line of dialogue in that movie had to do with something in the story there's no filler there's no oh hey what you have for lunch no there's no small talk there's no it's all just about what's going on in the movie and the story. You know? Yeah. All of Christopher Nolan's movies are kind of just a, a, like that. Nothing is wasted. It's just like... Yeah. Like uh, every line of dialogue when Bruce Wayne's Bruce Wayne, he's actually Batman. He's actually like fishing for something. Mm-hmm. He's actually trying to see if Harvey Dent's like a good dude or not. Yeah. It's it's interesting. It is interesting. Mm-hmm. So I like, don't think that... And the Joker never finds out who Batman is, right? The Joker? Yeah. No. Yeah. I think like my favorite scene is like the first the bank robbery in the beginning it's so good oh my god it's Mm -hmm. so good just like just the way they like use the like crane shots and like the zip lines and everything and just yeah it's a great scene yeah the whole movie's good i will say though watching this now and feeling how dated it is i maybe have a little less appreciation for it and that's hard to say. Yeah, right. Because it is such like a pinnacle movies for us. Yeah, yeah. And like young dudes growing up in the two thousands, you know, it's Dark Knight. Like that's like it the started. Shit. It started a lot of bad trends in cinema. Yeah, it really did. And but the thing is, like, it really made me appreciate Heat a lot more. Yeah, dude, Heat is actually better, dude. Just thinking about Heat and how it stood the test of time compared to this. Yeah, you know. No, Heat is, like, more realistic and, like, dialed down with the style and, like, doesn't have the super operatic type shit. Like, I think Heat is better. Yeah, me too. Me too. Like, Heat is, like, really good still. Like, came out, like, 1995. Yeah. You watch it now, it's still, like, fucking so good. Yeah. It's so realistic and, like, so well done and, like, not dated at all. No. And The Dark Knight is, like, kind of dated a little. I think the Hol- if you're into that Hollywood superhero movie style, then, you know, you probably love The Dark Knight. I, mean, I like The Dark Knight. You know? Yeah. I, no, I love The Dark Knight. I, I still love the movie. Do you still feel like it's, like, your favorite Christopher Nolan movie? Because when we did the rankings, you had a number one, right? I did, I had yeah. a number two, but now I'm, now I'm debating if it is my number two anymore. After yeah, now I'm it. debating if it's number one for me as well. Yeah, it might, yeah. like, 
might move Dunkirk above it, honestly. Yeah, like I might like I mean I had Memento number one. I might like some other movie. I might like Tenet more, just Yeah. Which is kind of funny to say that, but Yeah. I don't care, dude. Like Tenet is overhated and but the action is cooler in Tenet. Yeah. Just because it's like more new, you know, it's like every time Chris Nolan makes a movie it's like very new. It's just like a discussion we're having. It's not Yeah. I mean it's our opinions too, like we don't have to fucking change our opinions for other people, you know? Mm-hmm. Just, like, I just remember, it's kind of the nostalgia aspect of it, too. Like, Dark Knight, how it made me feel when I first saw it. Like, I've talked about it with my friends. I've seen it with my friends multiple times after. And, like, that wa- movie-watching experience really shapes your opinion on a movie. And then this one, like, I had a good time watching it. But just watching it with our friends, and especially, like, Jake and Luke and Brendan, people who like love movies and watch a lot of movies. I think we all kind of saw like the yeah, flaws we were all, in yeah, it. Yeah, we were all kind of talking, especially the fighting. Yeah. Like we were definitely talking about the fighting yeah. during the movie and like kind of laughing at yeah. the fights and then some of the dialogue. Yeah. Know, like you know, Harvey Dent. We were like laughing at Harvey Dent and Rachel. Yeah. And stuff, some of, yeah. like some of the characters are like, like the dude who's it's like super dramatic yeah it's super yeah. dramatic and like the dude who's like gonna sue batman he's like i know who batman is oh yeah it's i love Bruce that guy it's yeah. like, he's so little he's such a little sneaky little yeah little snake yeah little, little rat yeah yeah yeah, yeah. but um no not a bad movie not a bad movie at all that's not what we're saying definitely dated and worth a watch in 2023 just to see how it's changed and evolved yeah and we kind of had some takes, some hot takes for this movie that's so beloved, you know? Yeah. But I don't know if it's... Uh, just, just start opinion, dude. Just yeah. Opinion. Our tastes have changed too, right? Yeah. I think he, like, did it better, even though it, like, kind of copied Heat. Well, it's funny because the aspects that I really love about Heat, which is, like, you know, this super professional, you know, thief versus this, like, kind of dark cop that cat and mouse kind of chase they have with yeah, one another yeah we're all aspects that i still love in dark knight mm-hmm. you know the, the the aspects of the joker versus the batman and how it's like the joker craves this this cat and mouse kind of game those all still hold up really well mm-hmm. that's still the best aspect of the dark knight just in terms of heat and what they were able to do and, and the shots they were able to get in downtown la like you couldn't do that nowadays no no, no one would make that movie anymore I think they're like they're doing a heat too. Did you know that? Yeah. With Adam Driver. Yeah. I gotta watch Ferrari and see like how where we're at with Michael Mann nowadays. Yeah. Cause you aren't a big fan of Miami Vice. No. Yeah. Some people like swear by that movie, but apparently there's a director's cut. Did you watch that version? No. I don't think so. I don't know. Uh yeah. Miami Vice is but people like it because I think they like the overall vibe of it even though it doesn't make any sense and like when the action scenes happen you don't feel anything because like the, the stakes you don't know what the stakes are and like you don't care about any of these characters and shit i haven't watched it since like 2009 or some yeah shit. but anyway anything more you want to say about the dark knight it definitely shaped superheroes nowadays it mm-hmm. shaped like the movies we watch mcu wouldn't be as big as it is today without the dark knight the batman wouldn't be here without the dark knight you know know. and i think that's really cool and you can't understate that enough i just hope they don't bring back christian bale's batman from the multiverse dude they might when he's like fucking like 60 who's that no (gasps) i'm the batman (laughs) yeah no yeah i don't think so you today just watched Suspiria 2018 for the first time, directed by Luca Guardanino. How did you feel about it? I liked it. Yeah, I you may, liked it? I may have liked it even more than the original. Yeah, I mean, I don't think I like it more than the original, but it's definitely a really good interpretation slash remake of the original. Yeah, I would consider it more of an interpretation because it doesn't really follow along the same lines as the original. It takes inspiration from it. Yeah, this, the original is more of a mystery and the like random people dying. Whereas in this one, you kind of see the behind the scenes of the mystery beforehand, like this, this coven of witches. Whereas mm-hmm. in the first one, Dario Argento one, it's more of like a mystery and she kind of uncovers this witch stuff that's going on. Yeah. 
but it still has the same type. It has like the same vibe of this sort of dreamlike randomness that's going on. So I know they're not necessarily all doesn't necessarily have to all make sense, but it's almost like on purpose that it doesn't like make sense. Like the the going ons of these witches, just kind of like a bunch of image creepy imagery and dreamlike spell stuff, and you don't necessarily know like the motivations or what exactly is going on because this is the third. I've seen this movie three times now, so I kind of like get it now. Mm-hmm. I, like I think I've gotten to that point. I think you watch the movie three times, you kind of understand it like yeah more and shit. And and there's just some things that you're just not going to, like, understand, like, what the fuck is going on. You know what I mean? But yeah. it's more of the experience of it. Just just like in a lot of Dario Argento movies, they're just kind of more about the vibe, this dream-like, qual- nonsensical quality that Luca Guardino taps into. But also, it's, it does feel cohesive, too, yeah. at the same time. I mean, Luca Guardino's an artist. He's an artor. His movies are beautiful. Like, I like everything he puts out, dude. He's so fucking good. Mm-hmm. And he definitely stylized this movie beyond what Dario Argento set up. Dario Argento has the whole giallo movement, and that in itself is revolutionary. I feel like he he kind of goes beyond that and kind of puts more of like a like a modern flavor onto it, like his his own flavor. It's more grounded the Luca Guardino one. It's more grounded, whereas the yeah. Dario Argento one is way more colorful and, and dreamlike, and there's just random colors there. And the deaths the deaths are just like the deaths are set pieces. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Whereas like the deaths and this are not. Like, how many deaths? I mean, there's, like, the, the carnage at the end and shit. Yeah. But there's only, like, really one death scene in this with, yeah. with the dancing. And yeah. I'm a big fan of Dario Argento and Giallo and Italian cinema in general. Suspiria, I, I don't think it's really a Giallo. It's more like of a supernatural mm-hmm. thriller where, like, a Giallo is more of a murder mystery. Yeah. That involved, this is, like, this is a, super, like, it's nice. a supernatural horror, Italian horror movie. Yeah. But he's obviously famous for his, his giallo. Do you want to talk about like what it's about? It takes place in Berlin, divided Berlin, and specifically it takes place in Western Berlin. When when would you say it's set? Like in like... It's 1977. It's set in 1977. 77? Yeah, during the barter Maynoff kidnapping, there was these like extremists in Berlin at the time in Germany. His name was Andre Bader. Who the was RAF? Like a, yeah, yeah, yeah. Andre Bader is was like this extremist terrorist in Berlin. There's a subplot in this movie. Yeah. Of the the kidnapping these yeah. these women keep disappearing from this dance school. Yeah. So it it's a Berlin like a renowned Berlin dance school, and our main character Daisy Joan, who plays um, Dakota Johnson. Dakota Johnson. <laughs> She's from Ohio. She's from like an Amish community in Ohio, so like really out there. She goes to Berlin to dance, and the dance teacher is played by Tilda Swinton. Yeah, the head of the witches. Yeah. Yeah. Madame Blanc is played by Tilda Swinton, and she also plays two other roles in this yeah. movie, too. Who are the two other roles? The psychotherapist, and then she plays... Marcos? Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. So she's like a dance teacher. Basically, all these women are going missing from this dance school. Dakota Johnson quickly is rising the ranks and is a really talented dancer. It's just kind of about unraveling this mystery of what's going on making sense of what's going on because you know something's going on you're just not quite sure what it is a movie like this you, i think it, you, you'll appreciate it more and like it more if you have understanding and you've seen like italian horror movies and what they are because i i saw this movie back when it came out the music box in chicago and i i brought riley mm-hmm. too and like at the end with all the fucking carnage he was just like what the fuck is this like what yeah like, I don't think he kind of got the, the sort of vibe that it was going for in this sort of Italian horror yeah. shit that, that went down. It's just, like, super-duper violent. But apparently, like, Luca Guadagnino showed this movie to Quentin Tarantino, and Quentin Tarantino, like, loved it. Yeah. You know, he was, like, crying at the end or some shit like that, <laughs> you know, which makes sense. It was just, like, so brutal in the yeah. end of all the heads exploding and shit, yeah. and, like, she, like, rips her chest. And, yeah, it's just, a, it, it's an insane. It's, like, not even, like, a spoiler talk about the ending because, like, it's just so random yeah. and shit. It's, like, not, you know, it's more it's about the experience. It's very abstract at the end. Mm-hmm. Like, it's very, like, dude, slow shutter frames. Like, they really start introducing, like, all these crazy visuals and just, like, artistic take from what was previously grounded grounded mm-hmm. movie mm-hmm. in the first half yeah and, and tilda swinton plays the, the the main lead dance instructor and it's like very like very art kind of like pretentious dance school yeah. and shit it's like not that like the dancing it's like not like that cool dude 
good. No, like, it, but it is like choreographed really well. Yeah, it's choreographed well, and they do a cool job with that. But like, it's not like the dancing is not that interesting to me. Yeah, maybe not for like us, you know. Yeah. But I do. It's very art ho. Yeah, it is. I do respect Tilda Swinton in this fucking movie. She's so good. Mm. Oh my god, dude, she carries this movie. Like every character she plays is distinct from one another mm-hmm. and really like carries the scene even when she's playing this meek little german guy chloe grace moretz is in this yeah she is and she goes to her psychotherapist she's talking to him about witches and all this stuff that's going on at the dance school and she's just freaked out totally out of her mind from what mm-hmm. it seems and he starts investigating what's going on at the school this super old german guy and that's kind of a storyline throughout the whole movie that kind of the things are revealed to us at the same time they're revealed to the psychotherapy mm-hmm. right so he's kind of our our lens for the audience mm-hmm. also mia goth is in this too mia like, goth is in this yeah does a lot of weird horror movies she does like yeah. david cronenberg probably loves this yeah. scene and shit and like brandon cronenberg probably loves this movie too yeah it's definitely like among that same lines yeah rightfully so though it's a good movie there's kind of this uh feminism type vibe going on in this movie too yeah but it really like in a really like good well done way yeah yeah in a really good well done not like a preachy way it has yeah. like a lot to do with like feminism and especially in the 70s too like there was definitely like a lot of the feminist movement and these women who are at this uh dance conservatory and they don't get taken advantage of by like the men like when the cops come in they like kind of put a spell on them and like make a joke of them and yeah. stuff they don't even remember it and yeah. This whole subplot with the, the psychiatrist and his wife and like how he didn't save her from like the Holocaust. And when you talk about, you know, when we talk about witches, even in Hexon, a lot of people think that witches are just female hysteria. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And it's like a kind of a theme of, you know, back in the day when they were punishing for being witches, they were just because they would, they would call them witches because they were being quote unquote hysterical. Would it be taken seriously? Yeah, I think that was kind of something I picked up more on watching this. You know, it's all like it's mostly just women in this movie yeah you know yeah i thought that was pretty interesting it was it was cool i love the relationships they have with one another i really love tilda swinton like her character and the way they as opposed to the original suspiria you're basically invited in to the witch covenant right off the bat Mm -hmm. and you kind of know they're witches you know there's like magic and spells that are going on but it also humanizes them in a way yeah. Where Tilda Swinton really does like care for these girls and cares for the coven, but she also cares for like the art of what she's doing. Mm. Like the dancing is like spells, it's like a witch ritual, mm. but she really does like care about like the craft of it and stuff. And I, I think that I like really respect that. I really love like Tilda Swinton's character, Madame Blanc, her relationship she has with Dakota Johnson. And the, like this one definitely has way more developed backstory than the the original the original one there's not really like doesn't really explain anything there's a big exposition scene in the first one with Udo Kier where he just explains everything to Jessica yeah. Harper yeah and apparently Jessica Harper makes a cameo in this movie I don't know wh- who she plays or... M- maybe one of the witches yeah <laughs> perhaps yeah because there was some girls that popped up you know at the end where people's heads are exploding mm-hmm. that I'm like I've never seen this person before yeah so it's it's but Tenebrium is Tenebrae yeah you know what I mean like that's another Dario Argento is yeah. all the movie that's really good. The Three Witch Trilogy or something mm-hmm. like that. Because there is this well, the whole Three Witch Trilogy. Three Witch Trilogy is Suspiria, Inferno, and The Mother of Tears, which came out in 2007. But Tenebrae is not a witch movie. That's that's just its own standalone Jalo. Hmm. It's not a supernatural. But stylistically, this movie is definitely like way more grounded. And then when you you have these really cool stylistic dream sequences that are like in some really creepy imagery going on, it's a uh, definitely very interesting. Those shots yeah. and yeah all the edits and well crafted and sound is really good and just like imagery is just really, really gross yeah yeah you know? it is like there's a lot of like really gross scenes and, and spooky scenes for sure yeah best part i thought and i think you agree with this is the when dakota johnson's dancing for the first time and the other girl's contorted yeah yeah the body yeah. horror scene yeah oh man that was disturbing mm-hmm. but done so well mm-hmm. oh my god Luca Guardino really puts his own like flavor in this movie too. Like just all like the takes and cuts and inserts he intentionally shows the audience to give you like a feel of the time, a feel of the the environment we're watching. It, he takes his time with it and it pays off. 
Yeah, I, I, I fuck with him. Like, his last three movies are all, like, kind of masterpieces. Yeah, yeah. Like, Bones and All, really good. Suspiria is good. Call Me By Your Name is good. They're, and they're all period pieces, too. Yeah. They all take place in, like, the 80s or, like, 70s. Mm-hmm. They're all so fucking good. Oh, yeah. my God, dude. Yeah. Fuck with him hard. Yeah, yeah. He's, like, one of the only interesting Italian directors working today. <laughs> yeah. Like, Italy used to be so good at films. And yeah. now, like, what the fuck? Like, they they don't do shit now, dude. I know. All this, the golden era was, like, the 60s, 70s, 80s, 50s. What are they doing over there? Yeah. Not, nothing. Yeah. Besides, yeah. Luca Quare Nino. But his movies are, like, American productions. They're not even... A t- he's, like, an Italian director working in, like... American. On American yeah. like productions, like English. Yeah, there's not a lot going on in Italy, cinema-wise. They're probably just lazy now. <laughs> I don't know. There probably are people over there, you know? It's just Hollywood's overblown nowadays. Everyone comes to Hollywood to, like, make movies. Yeah, no one's really talking about foreign movies from Italy. Like, besides, like, La Grande Bellezza, The Great Beauty, yeah. which, which is good. I like that. Besides, Zario Argento is still making movies, which is cool. Pretty badass. Yeah. I really enjoyed this movie. I'm glad I watched it. I, I didn't think you would like it, dude. Yeah. I didn't think you would like it because I either, like, it was just going to be too fucked up for you or, like, you're going to be, like, because you, you, you don't really like horror movies. You kind of get a little scared. Yeah, I'm a little scared. It definitely creep me out at times. I just don't like jump scares, dude. If it's, like, if I know what's going on, I know, like, terms I'm agreeing to probably can watch it but if there's like gonna be some jump scares or some shit yeah i don't really fuck with that yeah this is like the first horror movie we've watched on the show but it's it's definitely like an art house sort of vibe to it it's not your typical horror movie like you're not gonna bring like a pleb off the street to watch the spirit of 2018 they just no i don't think they would really vibe with it no especially the ending it really gets kind of out there art housey yeah 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 yeah. it gets like really ridiculous but it's like kind of meant to be not understandable dreamy like bell type shit you don't yeah. necessarily have to know what the, like technically what's going on yeah i really like the ending i like the way it ends it's a really good witch movie dude yeah it's a really good witch movie yeah yeah the ending's really good though i really felt satisfied with this ending as opposed to the original suspiria where i felt like it left a lot to be desired um, i like i like the original more though yeah one of the greatest italian horror movies ever made everyone after that movie like that that style of the the colors and shit i mean i think mario baba did a little bit but dario jenna took it to like that mainstream level where now you're you're seeing like nicholas whining refin is definitely inspired by dario Argento. you know jasper noe panos cosmatos Mm -hmm. like all those really stylistic colorful directors they don't like they wouldn't have existed without suspiria yeah he really dialed in that real expression expressionistic formulas formulistic or like formalism style mm-hmm. or as a look at water nino's version it is less expressionist it's more realist yeah but it's still stylized right so it's a very modern take on the uh original one yeah. and like we said it, it really like draws from the time period it's referencing mm-hmm. So a lot to do with the social political climate of Berlin at the time. I like that because I felt like that's an aspect that I didn't even think of in the original. But they are not afraid to show in this one. Mm. It was cool. It was cool. I fucked with it. Yeah, I fucked with it too, dude. Yeah, if you're like a horror fan, check it out. There's definitely some stuff in there really well made. I mean, I don't think it's for everyone, but... No, it's not for everyone. If you like Bones and All and Call Me By Your Name, the director, the way he... He's able to like craft a story. You're probably going to like this. Mm-hmm.